So at what point should a man just admit he's defeated and, and swallow that pill of humbleness that he needed? Cause I didn't draw the picture right. I see myself in better light. I'm bigger than my body give me credit for, right? So I sing an ode to the sketchbook, cause you all I got. And I ain't trying to get mixed with these fools on the block, but it seemed like the streets got a magnet in them. Heavy metals in our jeans, so we sag our denim. See, I was Mr. Swim against the tides, can't miss him. Only black among the essays, man, them were the days. It was only one way to protect you from them vatos flamers going bang. It was say habla Spanglish. Lo siento, señora, espera. And that city sing a song to make a veteran blush. Kids who can't get in gear, stripping their clutch, but them blank pages. And they sing to me, like, this how God sees you. And you'll say, I don't believe you, but soon the world will need you. And if you give him a chance, he could Michelangelo you. A Sistine Chapel masterpiece fresco you. There was nothing more honest than an artist's sketchbook. It's a visual depiction of how God's love looks. And I learned, I'm not the artist, I'm the canvas. So I'll be like, come and get your fingers dirty. I get paint on your hands. That's the fun part of art. Put the color where it lands. See, I'm a blank page and he fills me with life changes. A color depiction of what it could be, it should be, but sometimes. It feels like the lines don't match the picture. It bothers me because I've seen the scripture. So I patiently maintain this fire that's in my chest. It's the line between hungry and desperate. And I got to be more stubborn in this wall that I'm pushing at. Convinced of the vision like what are y'all looking at? Because if you've seen what I've seen, then you would roll your sleeves up too. That's why I never understand how it felt to be them. I bet it's so mundane. But that sketchbook sings to me simple and plain. You cannot turn around. You cannot not try. Because stick with it, and this is how we got, got by. And I learned I am not the artist. I'm the canvas. You. You ain't the artist. Hands. This was uh, probably one of my earlier pieces. It was on an album that most of y'all probably haven't heard. And the phrase was very simple. It's like, I'm not the artist, I'm the canvas. The thing took off and it was probably one of the most successful uh, uh, like merch items that, that we've made. And I think it's not so much because I'm some sort of poetic genius, I'ma let you call that. Uh, it was more, I think the phrase just kind of resonates with, a, with just a good way to look at the world. You know, there's a great number of things that we, we live and have to live with that really we had no control over. And if we're honest, uh, sometimes those things can kind of bother us. You know, we didn't choose our parents, we didn't choose the neighborhood, we didn't choose the year we were born, you didn't choose, you didn't choose the family you was born in, you didn't choose your ethnicity, right? Um, all those things were things that were kind of handed to you. And sometimes when you feel like things that are handed to you can make you feel like you're not really in control of your own destiny, right? That reality for me really led to a lot of identity issues I kind of had, man. I was, I'm from South Central Los Angeles. I grew up in a, a, a very violent neighborhood, but it was a, all Latino neighborhood. Right. So I really stuck out, you know, and um, for a long time, man, I felt like I was born the wrong color in the wrong city, among the wrong neighborhood with the wrong people and wrong language and 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 uh, in the wrong time. You know, when my parents became became Christians, uh, at some point they pointed me to, to Psalms uh, chapter 139. And he says that, uh, you know, before you were in the womb, I knew you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made fearfully and wonderfully made. So this concept, I think, really helped me have a better understanding of, of, of self-identity and self-worth. And I think it might have been specifically because, like I told you before, my first love was visual arts, right? And as a visual artist, there's lines and, and gestures that help shape the drawing that won't be there at the end, but you know they're necessary to get to that finished product. But if someone were to look over your shoulder, oftentimes, they may have opinions about this picture and how things are supposed to look, but they're not in your brain. They don't see what you see, right? You get kind of frustrated when people look over your shoulders like that. And the first thing I know I wanted to do was while they looking over my shoulder, kind of be like, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about, right? That's what I want to do. The reality was they didn't see what I saw. I'm looking at this and I know where I'm going. Like I see the finished product they don't see it so they're just looking at what's on the paper and they think it's crazy right 
And then <laughs> I sometimes picture what if a drawing I was working on kind of looked back up at me and said I wasn't drawing it right. Like it stopped in the middle and was like, why are you, why are you drawing me this way? What's wrong with this, right? Besides running in terror that uh, my drawing actually spoke to me. Probably the next thing I would do was erase its mouth because I mean, I can't believe you, like, what do you know? Like, how you gonna tell me what I'm gonna do with the drawing, right? But, but it's preposterous. Like, it doesn't know. I am the artist. I know what I'm trying to get you to And I'm not gonna make anything hideous. Like, I'm, I am going to make the best work I can make, right? The artist has a finished product in mind and a master artist knows he's creating a masterpiece or knows she's creating a masterpiece. A master sculptor, right? Or, or a carpenter, right? If you have a, a, a block of marble, like it's just a rectangle or even like a, 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 a piece of wood, like a, like a tree stump, what, what's the beauty in that is the, the sculptor sees the finished product inside of that thing. And then they got to work with these chisels and hammers and, and you got wood and stone flying everywhere. It's loud, it's messy, it looks kind of violent. Then they get real slow and they just kind of chiseling little pieces and lightly tapping because the whole time they had the finished product in mind. So they knew, I gotta chunk off this piece, I gotta chunk off that piece. And, and us looking outside is like, I don't even know where you're going with this, but they do, right? They see the finished product. But let's be real. Let's, let's forget all the poetic uh, comparisons and metaphors. Let's forget all that. Let's be real. Life can suck. There's pain. There's evil in the world. There's suffering. And these things are incredibly huh, real, right? And it's all over the world. And oftentimes, as we look at the suffering and, and, and things around us and the evil that exists, not only, with, not only with the people we know, but people all over the world, it's tough to think of a, an idea that there's a good God that would allow for this type of suffering to happen. So now we have to make sense of evil and you have to make sense of suffering, right? If the idea that a good God can allow for evil, then that would mean that either that God is not in fact good or he does not exist, right? So we rebel and we come up with other answers for the things of the world. So now, what do I do with evil? Well, you could go the way that Alfred went. Alfred, you know, Batman's butler, Alfred. He said some people just like to see the world burn and burn it does all over the world man and, and not to mention natural disasters and earthquakes and tsunamis like destroying entire villages there's famine and there's just and there's things that like governments have made and there's unfair governments and there's genocides and just all these things that are structural problems that are built into the fabric of all of our civilizations how in the world do these things exist and why do we have to live in them so what do you do with all that? What do you do with all that? Well, the Christian answer is we say the ultimate problem for all these things is sin. Sin. Sin is what separated us from the Father. Sin is the part of us that rebels and says, I want control of our own destiny, right? That, that part of us that is so viciously selfish and would do any and everything to take care of ourselves and preserve our own feelings and our own safety. And we will lie, we will cheat, we will steal, we will kill. Now, some of us have never pulled a gun on nobody to kill somebody, but I tell you what, that does not mean you have not participated in the type of selfishness that could hurt another person. It is sinful. Sin, sin is what puts us on the throne and we shake our fist at God and we say, you are not the controller of my destiny. Sin is a systemic problem. What do I mean by that? It is within all of us. We all have a nature in us that desires things that are not good for us. We desire things that makes us function not the way that we were designed. We weren't designed to be so selfish. We weren't designed to hate each other the way. We weren't designed to cause pain like we do, right? But it's not just us, right, that, that are affected by sin. All of creation, all of nature is affected by this. What it did is it separated us. It separated us from our maker. It caused us to have, if anything, a corrupted hard drive, if you will, where somehow or another, 
all of nature is, is not functioning the way for which the maker designed it to function. So when Jesus comes, says these revolutionary things, challenges the system, plans a new kingdom, he gives an answer to these questions. When he again called himself the mediator between God and man, that was to unite us again. He's saying our choice is for sin separate us and it not only separates us it separated creation from the father it separated uh, 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 the entire functioning that the father designed for us to function it created a wedge in between these things and Jesus said I came to make it possible for us to be united with the father again but also to display for you a better way for us to live to function the way that you have been designed so now what nature says there's something more that something more has to be God, that God illuminates us to his son. His son says your problem is sin, which has separated you, but I'm gonna make a way to reconcile you with the Father. And now we're here, a place where we've recognized our weaknesses, our need for reconnection, and our forgiveness of sins. What does that do? Well, I think of the world differently. I now think of the world the way for which God described it. He said, the greatest of these is a servant. He said, we love our neighbor as ourselves. And in you showing love, you receive love. And there are gifts that the father gives and a servant finds the most joy in seeing the master being glorified. And the master finds incredible joy in giving the servant gifts. And what are those gifts that the, that the father or that the king gives us, that the master gives us? Well, it's belonging, it's love, it's purpose. It's joy. Those things that we sought before, he's actually giving them to us. They're ours. He's giving them. That's a beautiful thing.